Welcome, I'm Feek the Signifier, and I just want some of your time. Today, we're gonna to start out with a little thought experiment. So what I want you to do right now is close your eyes. If you're not like, you know, driving. So if you're just like on the toilet or getting ready for bed or something, this is perfectly fine. Just close your eyes, okay? So, I want you to picture in your head black men movie stars, okay? But specifically, I want you to think of like the A-listers, the cream of the crop guys. These are guys that when they drop a movie, they're getting top billing, right? They are commanding top dollar. They usually only come up with one or two movies a year because they're big stars and that's just how they get down. Who are you seeing? You're probably seeing Denzel Washington, maybe Will Smith, The Rock. When I get finished with you. Once upon a time, this probably would have included Chadwick Boseman. Put that away. I want you to come back. I still close. And I want you to think of the tier under that. So this is maybe your Idris Alba, Samuel L. Jackson, maybe Don Cheadle. All right, let's go back in time. All right, keep your eyes closed. But let's go back to like the late 80s, mid 90s era. All right, we're thinking of the same guys, top tier black men in Hollywood. So who do you got? You got Eddie Murphy. You got maybe Danny Glover. You got Wesley Snipes. Okay, all right. Now, just, just for the sake of balance, let's look into the future. Let's think about some black men who are, you know, on the verge of breaking out as big time stars in Hollywood. So maybe this is Trevante Rhodes, Jonathan Majors, Winston Duke, AKA Mbaku. Like these are guys that you know at some point in time, they're gonna get a starring role and one or two of them is gonna break out into that next level. Okay. So we've imagined all of these men. I want you to open your eyes. Okay. Who are these dudes? Do you know? I, I bet that if you're not black, you probably don't even recognize many of these faces. If you are black, you may recognize some of the faces, you may recognize some of the people, but you might be like, what do I know that person from? Now, when I put these two groups together, what are you noticing? Yeah, it's like a reverse Tyler Perry movie, isn't it? What do you think about that? How does it make you feel? Got some questions? Yeah, this is where we're going today. This is the Black Media Breakdown. In 1915, the silent film Birth of a Nation became possibly the first ever like big budget blockbuster film. It revolutionized filmmaking to the point that even today, despite the fact that the film has vehemently and overtly racist imagery and messages, the film is still being shown around the country to film students as just a way to look at the evolution of modern filmmaking. In the movie, African-Americans, especially African-American men, are presented as subhuman savages and a general threat to everybody around them. They are the clear antagonists, and it's not until the heroic Ku Klux Klan comes in and helps wrestle power from black people through voter suppression that the day is saved or something, I don't know. Y'all best believe I didn't fucking watch this. 20 years later, King Kong became possibly the second major blockbuster, again revolutionizing film, with never before seen innovation and special effects. In it, a giant gorilla from a lost island in Southeast Asia, somehow populated by dark-skinned Afro-natives who spoke in tribal gibberish, is captured by a white man and put in chains, and taken to the United States where he falls in love with a effeminate, beautiful white woman and climbs to the top of a building where he holds her captive until he is shot down by heroic and brave white men and the beautiful damsel in distress is rescued and reunited with her true love. According to the film's director and creator, Marion C. Cooper, the film was not meant to be overtly racist. And I mean, low key, I believe him. It's 1933. It's not like he really had any reason to lie. He wasn't gonna get 
dragged on Twitter or deep platform. So still, both of these films are similar and irrexably linked both as modern classics to filmmaking and filmmaking technique, but also in that they stirred racial turmoil and the ongoing fearful scourge that was black men's physicality and sexuality. Fast forward almost 100 years, and while still not fully accessing the total level of acceptance and stardom that their white counterparts have, it's hard not to see that black men in Hollywood don't enjoy a certain level of power and influence that may have seemed impossible 100 or so years ago when these dudes still had to run around with bones in their noses shouting Oonga Boonga. A little over a week ago, as of time of recording, Yara Zaid showed us why she's one of the best new people in the game with a video essay on the character Rue from the Hunger Games book slash movie and how her being played by a black girl at the time, 12 year old Amandala Stenberg set Twitter on fire as racists came out of the woodwork to complain on this beloved character being portrayed by a black actress. This happened in 2011. This was well before we really understood like how ugly and awful social media could be. This is also well before the same controversy would happen again and again with characters like Heimdall and Thor or Kid Flash or the multitude of times that we have seen white characters racially swapped just to improve inclusion for movies marketing. However, what made this situation with Rue even dumber and more abhorrent was the fact that the character was always depicted as black in the source material and that Stenberg was only 12 years old and catching the brunt of this ridiculous hate mob on Twitter. Yara does a great job of fully fleshing out the whole thing. It's one of the best videos that's dropped all year, so please check it out. I ring it up because while I was watching it, I was like legit jealous. This was a great video and it was tackling this profound moment in black media and I knew I could never really talk about it with the same level of insight and depth that she did as a black woman herself. But she did hit on something that set me on a different angle on the topic when she pointed out that despite the fact that Rue was appropriately played by a black girl, the character in the book was definitely described as being darker than Amandala Stenberg. She then further points out that this is something that happens a lot with black women in the media. There is minimal space for dark skinned black women to be seen and it seems like every black female character that is on TV or in the movies is at best brown skin or light and more often biracial or racially ambiguous but coded black by the medium. For a lot of filmmakers, biracial is the default for blackness. This is most evident with Netflix originals, where any and all black girl characters are as light or lighter than a paper bag. And again, most of the time, this is with women. Because when you see black male actors on screen, a lot of the time they are allowed to be dark skinned. They are allowed to have black features and it's not made a big deal out of. Skin complexion is more consequential for black women's lives than black men's. Intersectionality theory provides a lens through which we can understand how light skin affords special advantages and opportunities to African American women in ways that it does not for men. Hence, Thresh is allowed to be played by a dark skinned actor and Rue is not. It's that last part that really struck me, the fact that Rue's counterpart from the same district was allowed to keep his color. I immediately realized that Yara and Really nobody in these YouTube streets has really taken on an in-depth look at the way complexion works for black men, especially in mainstream media. Furthermore, when we talk about colorism intra-racially, for the most part, we are almost always talking about the experiences of black women. This is greatly because of the way that society views black women as a whole and the significant discrepancy in their experiences versus everybody else. There are literally probably hundreds of better videos by black women on this platform that go into this better than I can, and I'll link some in the description if this is a new phenomenon to you. But as a general overview, understand that light-skinned black women are seen by society, black people included, as more attractive, more virtuous, more innocent, more trustworthy, etc. And thus dark-skinned black women are hit with the counterbalance of all of those positive traits and seen in a much more negative light. Furthermore, because we live in a patriarchal society, elements such as beauty are invaluable to the experiences of women and thus dark-skinned black women are hit with an extra layer of oppression as they are not only harmed by the overall system of racism that harms all black people, but they also face an extra layer of harm and sometimes even exclusion within black communities, often at the hands of black men. There's a ton of research that backs this up, by the way, and I guess I'll link some of that in the description as well. Again, you can find plenty of videos, articles, papers, and books that get into this area of the topic. 
I want to bring that to people's attention because this video will be, I guess, relatively unique in that I will not be censoring the experiences of colorism as it pertains to black women. And I want people to understand that before they continue so that nobody comes to me asking why or how I wasn't addressing this in this whole possibly hour long, 30 minute long video. What you won't find in a lot of places is a deeper examination of the issue as it pertains to the views and experiences of black men of varying shades. And here's where I feel like I come in. If you're new to the channel, first of all, welcome. Please like, share, and subscribe. But secondly, understand that I'm like a lot of left-leaning media analysis, philosophy-related channels, except I do have the explicit focus that I try to engage critically with masculinity as a topic of discussion a bit more than at least what I've seen on YouTube. And that's what we're gonna do today. We are going to re-engage with the concept of colorism and black stereotypes from the perspective and standpoint of men's experiences, explicitly thinking about how it affects their views and experiences as men. What exactly is the deal with the media's preference for darker skinned black men? Do light skinned men feel that they're being erased in mainstream media or do they barely notice it or do they just not care? Is this a thing at all? Am I just being extra woke and making something up? Understand first and foremost that race is a social construct and at a fundamental level it's not a real thing. It's a lot like gender in that our understanding and belief in it as a society is what makes it real. And thus it can change based on the way society changes its views and opinions and value. My favorite example of this is the concept of whiteness, which like right now, when we think of white people, we think of, you know, white people, but a good like hundred or so years ago, the concept of being white didn't really exist in America. If you were a person who would consider white in America, you would probably be considered Irish or Italian or German or Polish or some other European ethnicity. And those ethnicities didn't always get along and they had their own set of slurs and negative opinions and belief systems about each other. It wasn't until white had to be the opposite of black that white became a thing, but that's like, that's like a whole other essay. Also, I found a lot of black folks have different definitions on how to define their complexion or even their ethnicity. And I'm not about to try to present hard line definitions on how to view yourself. I, my personal rule is whatever the police think you are. I'm not, I'm not saying that's what you got to be. I'm just saying that's how the world generally sees you and you should respond accordingly. Tiger Woods is a good example. When he came out saying he was Cabo Asian. Anyway, it's going to be impossible to always come to like a 100% agreement on the categorization of people like I don't know, the, the Rock or Common, or maybe even Will Smith. Are those men light skin, dark skin? Is The Rock even considered black? The bottom line is this. Tay Diggs has never been called light skin. Michael Ely has never been called dark skin. We will kind of use common sense as much as possible and go from there. Part one, I might be reaching a little bit. Are light skinned men really underrepresented in the media in general? By this, I mean not just Hollywood, but sports, music, and other forms of entertainment. So I think it's definitely pretty easy to show that this is a thing when it comes to movies. You'd be hard pressed to find many even B tier black actors in the movies who are light skinned. Now there are more light skinned men who are in leading roles on TV, but in the movies, it's pretty much non-existent. I mentioned Michael Ely, who has had a few prominent roles in mainstream movies and shows, but for the most part, he's either a bit player, but when he does have a prominent role, it's usually in something that is only being marketed to black people, which is fine, but it does show that Hollywood and people in general don't see him as a true big time star. Terrence Howard is probably the biggest black star of a lighter complexion that I can think of. And while he had a pretty strong season of films in like the late nineties to the early and mid two thousands, he's still really not anywhere near the level of the top black actors. This is not to say that there are not a lot of great light-skinned black actors, but they rarely get to be true stars of whatever they're in. Vin Diesel and The Rock are probably the best examples of light-skinned black men, but Vin Diesel and The Rock rarely ever play black characters or are even coded as black in their movies. Vin Diesel has literally played a white man before in one of the most bizarre roles of his movie career. Never lost the case. You're all going down. The men you see before you have engaged in all sorts of criminal activities. Mr. Denosha, you're on. I, I'm 
Jackie Donosio. Uh, I'm defending myself in this case. The Rock, who is black and Samoan, and he has said this before, has mostly been coded as Samoan. He played Roadblock in, I think, the second G.I. Joe movie, but the blackest thing he did outside of that was pop up in a Tyler Perry movie one time, which was, you know, random. So we're going to come back to film because I'm pretty sure I'm solid there, but let's look at other forms of media. Arguably, the biggest black star in any medium of entertainment is Drake. So that definitely is a win for light skin representation. That said, consider the amount of scrutiny and jokes Drake has endured from black folks since he came into prominence. I'm not a big Drake fan. I don't like him, but I can't rock with some of the things his critics say. Consider that Drake is often accused with being soft and emasculine, mainly because his music lacks the edge of many of his contemporaries in hip hop. But consider the fact that Kanye West was making very similar music with a much more emotional and sensitive element well before Drake. One could argue that Drake is only here because Kanye West paved the way for him. And although Kanye did receive his fair share of attacks on his masculinity early on in his career, he has never faced the type of attacks that Drake has faced despite his other transgressions. Before Drake, you'd be hard pressed to find another rapper of Drake's status who is Drake's complexion. Every half decade or so since the 90s, I'd argue that hip hop has had a few iconic crossover figures who dominate the industry and almost none of them have been Drake's complexion. R&B music is a different story, but it actually still kind of proves my point because black R&B singers have to embody a different type of masculinity than black rappers. Hip hop is very much a meritocracy, but branding and marketing has always been a big factor in the industry. And if they don't think they can brand you as a rapper, then they won't and you probably won't become a star. D Why are you tiptoeing? <laughs> Because <laughs> I, I didn't want to just like... <laughs> that was more distracting. <laughs> it's all right, what's up? Things are changing now because the music industry is very different and artists can go directly to the audience. But you have to wonder if guys like T.I. or Common or J. Cole from earlier eras before this was a thing are not bigger stars based partly on the fact that they are lighter skinned. Sports is also greatly a meritocracy. Becoming a sports star is much less dependent on your appearance than your actual talent in that sport. That said, I do find it odd that in basketball and football, the country's most popular sports, most of the stars that are black are dark-skinned black men. Today, LeBron James is probably the biggest star in all of sports, at least in America, let alone basketball. And I don't watch much basketball, so take this with a grain of salt. But when I think of basketball stars, along with LeBron James, I'm thinking Kevin Durant, Kawhi Leonard, Russell Westbrook, James Harden, etc. I don't think much of Steph Curry, but from my uninformed perspective, Curry should like be considered LeBron's biggest rival and probably be second in line to him in terms of notoriety in the NBA. He's the only person that's beat LeBron three times in the finals. Well, he's not the only person, but he's the main star of the team that did that. Football is a bit weaker because for one, like the players are wearing a helmet over their faces 90% of the time. Furthermore, a lot of the biggest stars in football are actually white men. However, when you look at the top 50 jersey sales for football players, 28 of the top 50 are black football players and only seven of those 28 could be loosely considered light skinned and I was kind of pushing it with that. I'm not gonna talk about baseball or other sports much because I don't I don't watch them and I, I would feel very weak in terms of trying to describe that, but you still have guys like Usain Bolt and the trio of dark-skinned African champions in the UFC. That said, when I looked at baseball, some guy named Mookie Betts popped up and fucked up my whole argument, so there's that. I also cannot speak with confidence on how this plays out in new media such as here on YouTube and in terms of other social media influencers on TikTok or Instagram. The stuff I was able to find kind of supported my argument, like the top black men in these areas still tend to be men of darker complexions or at least brown skin. So there's smoke to the fire, but at least in a lot of these areas, it's not a slam dunk for my argument. If I wanted to, I could definitely try to argue that there's some level of colorism in these areas, but I feel like I'll be reaching too much, so I'm gonna let those slide. Just know though. Mm -hmm. Part two, the Hollywood leading men. So I'm gonna stick to TV and movies, which I argue is more indicative of our cultural values. We don't get to choose who makes good music or who is a good athlete. That is not a crowdsourced ideology, but we do greatly get to choose what actors and movie stars we like. 
So why is it that we seem to like dark skinned men over their lighter skinned counterparts on movies and TV? To answer that, let's look at white A-listers in movies and TV in the like history of the concept of the leading man in general. Going all the way back to Hollywood's golden age, America has always had an idealized image of masculinity and femininity, which of course has always started with whiteness. Leading men from 75 years ago aren't all that different than a leading man from right now. At the risk of sounding like an insult, there's a lot of lookism that goes into who gets to be a movie star. Our Hollywood stars and the roles they tend to play have to have a certain visual representation. The research on attraction and sex selection is, but a lot of the research indicates that masculine features such as strong jaw lines, piercing eyes, deep voices, broad shoulders are generally preferred by audiences, men and women alike. But then it starts to get into eugenics and yeah. The social sciences tend to point to how much of our perception on what is attractive and what is not attractive in men and women is socially constructed. Meaning it's not some innate biological imperative that dictates what we find attractive, but the fact that we are influenced by the images and ideas around us. And this is definitely true to an extent, but regardless of whether you think it's all biology or social construction, whether it's nature or nurture, you can't not notice that Clark Gable looks a lot like Michael Fassbender. The image of the leading man is what it is, regardless of the reasons why. So what I'm getting at here is that there is a logic that goes into why certain stars are successful and work in certain roles in certain mediums and why others aren't. Some of it has to do with writing and direction, like you could be the best looking and most talented actor in the world. If you have a bad script, you will get nothing out of it. But to make certain things work, the actor on screen has to appeal to something in the audience and a chunk of what that appeal is is going to be socially and culturally based within that audience this is why all of hollywood's biggest black actors are about my complexion or darker something about america's value systems dictate that our leading black man need to be dark or the audiences just aren't going to buy it as i said in the edgelord video it's my personal opinion that when we are critical of certain types of media that we also have to be critical of who that media is geared for and who's actually watching it what i mean is that when we see something problematic in the media we shouldn't just assume that the media is creating this problematic ideology out of thin air the people that are making this had a belief that it would find an audience. And a lot of times it does. No matter how problematic you may think it is, if a movie comes out and it consistently finds an audience, then we need to be thinking about what's going on with that audience and what they believe as much as we're thinking about what the creator is trying to do and what messages are being spread. It's kind of a chicken or the egg situation, but this actually makes things even more confusing because in real life, Dark skinned black men do not enjoy many benefits from their complexion, despite what Hollywood representation might have us think. The audience may want to see black men in these movies, but in real life? Part three, The Curse of Ham. The Curse of Ham is a biblical event or story that happens in the book of Genesis. In the story, Ham does something wrong of some sort to his father, either embarrassing or possibly even violating him, I'm, I'm not sure. and. Noah curses Ham's son to have dark skin and for all his descendants to have dark skin. I don't really know, I'm not a biblical scholar, but I do remember this story because this story is very much integral to how white slave owners, white Christian slave owners, justify their treatment of slaves, saying that they were recipients of the curse of Ham. But even after slavery, having dark skin for a black person can very much feel like a curse. Dark skin in black Americans is connected to all sorts of negative experiences and beliefs about them. Darker skinned black men are seen as less trustworthy, more likely to engage in criminal or immoral activity, less clean, less hardworking, etc. Dark skinned black men don't get the same opportunities as their light skinned counterparts historically. Dark skinned black men are more likely to give in longer jail and prison times than light skinned black men. I'm sure some of you have heard of the brown paper bag test, which was a process that light skinned black people use to exclude darker skinned black people from certain social circles and clubs and events from pretty much the time that that was happening, probably up until the 1950s and 60s. As with any system of oppression, these types of micro transgressive behaviors also created bigger, more structural barriers to opportunity for dark skinned black people. 
For example, it's well known that HBCUs, aka historically black colleges and universities, are integral to black economic power in this country and have been such for over a century. But what people don't like to talk about is that HBCUs, a lot of them, especially the top tier ones, as you might call them, were greatly supported by white elites of the time. The ideology back then was that lighter skinned blacks who were often the children of black female slaves who were by white slave owners were smarter and more fit for intellectual tasks and were often supported from the shadows by their illegitimate parents. Thus, when you look at old pictures of HBCU students, you'll see a larger than expected representation of light-skinned black people. As such, education and black in that time meant that you were likely light-skinned. The obvious point here is that light-skinned black people are closer to whiteness and thus have always been privileged over their dark-skinned peers. This, however, manifests into something different when intersected with gender. Since white women have always set the beauty standard in Eurocentric and colonized nations, having lighter skin has always been associated with femininity. Conversely, darker skin has been associated with masculinity. Due simply to the need for gender to be polarized in a patriarchal society, this makes us look at these opposites with very gender perspective. This informs the classic phrase of tall, dark, and handsome. This is why you'll see women in photos from the industrial era and beyond, and sometimes all over the world, walking around with parasols to cover them from the sun. This is also why a lot of Hollywood leading men are not blind, like barely any. This concept of being closer to whiteness is a definite thing. Historically, this is seen in the way some black folks like move out to the suburbs and the names that black people give to their children. A lot of people don't know that Barack Obama went by Barry for most of his life because he did not want to evoke the African parentage that he had. You see this in fashion, like some quick free game. If you ever, ever want to look at a black guy and figure out if he's a conservative or a liberal, look at his haircut, possibly also his facial hair. This is a product of living in a system of white supremacy for generations. It takes a lot to persistently and regularly resist the pull of self-hatred that comes from existing in a society where you feel like people hate you. This experience of self-hatred that black men have is something that we don't talk about really enough. Black men are not overly capable and definitely not encouraged to speak on their pain. But having worked with black youth over the years, I will tell you that it is there. Hell, if you listen to hip hop, especially hip hop that's being made now, there have been black men telling you how much pain they're in for a long time. It just may not come through directly in the words, but you can always see it in the behavior. A lot of dark skinned women will speak on the types of bullying and ostracism they experience at the hands of their peers. This same thing does happen to black men as well, although slightly differently and maybe less severe. But I would argue that this is one reason why you see so many darker black men with Latino, white, or at least light skinned women. Black men being able to attain non-black women has always been a sign of status to some men. There's a profound and insightful, but also very, you know, disturbing essay from former Black Panther and and Republican Senator candidate Eldridge Cleaver that provides a powerful explanation of black men's psyche toward white women. Be warned though, if you didn't catch this, Cleaver was not a good man and the content of this book and his chapter is not for everyone. Like this book is foundational reading for any aspiring hotep, so enter at your own risk, but I do think it's worth a read. Still to me, he greatly hits the nail on the head of the psyche of some black men as it pertains to interracial dating. In this chapter, he calls the allegory of the black eunuchs. Cleaver, who was in jail at the time, crafts a fictional conversation between him, several of his peers, and an antagonistic figure they call Lazarus. And Lazarus, through a series of intense and crazed rants, discusses and regales the opinions of Cleaver on the racialized nature of black men's sexual dysfunction and desire for white women. I can't analyze it, but I know that the white man made the black woman as a symbol of slavery and the white woman as a symbol of freedom. Every time I embrace a black woman, I'm embracing slavery. And when I put my arms around a white woman, well, I'm hugging freedom. The white man forbade me to have the white woman on pain of death. Literally, if I touched a white woman, it would cost me my life. That was the white man's will. And as long as he has the power to enforce his will upon me, force me to submit to his will in this instance or in any other, I will not be free. I will not be free until the day 
I can have a white woman in my bed and a white man minds his own business. Until that day comes, my entire existence is tainted, poisoned, and I will still be a slave. So as bombastic and crazy as that may have sound, I do believe that it holds true for some black men. If you look at black men, especially from that era, the generations of black men well before me, especially the powerful and famous ones, you will see an abundance of black men with white women. Today, this trend has changed a little bit as things have progressed, but it's also changed from explicitly just white women to going after light skin or racially ambiguous women or foreigns as they're often called in hip hop parlance. And Bowie did a great video on why so many influencers have the same face. And that face kind of fits this description. It's vaguely ethnic, definitely not white, but not overtly black, but still having some black features. I'm not saying that every black man who refers white women or foreigns is suffering from self-hatred. My opinion is that people can low key like what they want. Even if it's a little problematic, life is too short, but you can't disentangle the forces that create this trend from systemic white supremacy. Furthermore, and here's like the real problem. So many of these men can't just like non-black women and shut up about it. They have to announce and yell at the top of their lungs, not only that they love white women or Latino women, but how much they hate black women. And if you have to do that, if you have to yell out loud about how much you hate black women, women that probably look like your mom, you definitely have a problem with black people and a problem with yourself. I just said, I don't like women with my complexion. I like light-skinned women. I want you to be lighter than me. I love African-American women, but I just don't like my skin complexion. Okay, okay, well, I like your skin complexion. We too gutter. Black, black people, my, my complexion, we too gutter. Light-skinned women, they more sensitive. You know, they too tough, they too tough. Light-skinned women, we could break them down more easy. You know what I'm saying? Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, ain't gonna lie, I know I'm ugly, too. You think you're ugly? Love peace, love peace. So I know if, if if I fought with a black bear, we gonna have a black ass baby. So? I ain't with that. That said, I always try to lead with empathy. When I hear these types of comments, we should consider the root cause instead of just the symptoms. I made the comment that these women look like these guys' moms, but recognize that some of these guys' moms might have been abusive, that they may not have had positive experiences with black women in their lives that led them to this ugly attitude. Now, this doesn't excuse it or make it a right thing to do, but at least it gives me perspective on where it comes from, which gives me perspective maybe on how to address it. When you grow up associating blackness with struggle and poverty, of course, you internalize a sense of self-hatred that manifests in a lot of ways. Poverty and social dysfunction are always going to exacerbate problematic belief systems. For dark-skinned black men especially, the world can feel incredibly hostile. You legit sometimes can feel cursed, as I've said before. This persistent experience of having to be hypervigilant is a big factor in the disruptive behavior of black men. It's psychologically damaging for black people to constantly see images of pain and death that we're inundated with and almost invariably those images are of black people with darker skin. Part four, the fetishization of black men. So in the face of all this, the implicit bias, the stereotypes, the colorism, etc., why is it that Hollywood seems to love black men so much? Why do they have the opposite response of not championing light-skinned men, but putting dark-skinned black men at the forefront? It's not because light-skinned men are seen as less attractive. We all remember Jeremy Meeks, a legit gangbanger and ex-criminal turned supermodel that captured the world's attention with a steely look that was captured in a mugshot. Michael Ealy has plenty of female and male fans. Jesse Williams ran the internet in black spaces for a few good years, and Reje Pei Jean, I hope I'm saying his name right, he just set the world on fire last fall as the Duke. Light-skinned black men are still seen as sexy, just like white men. See, while light-skinned black men can be sexy, what they usually aren't is fetishized. And by fetishized, I don't just mean sexually, I mean the actual disentanglement of black men's bodies from their personhood for the sake of gratification, whether that be sexual or otherwise. Dark-skinned black men's bodies are commodified in a very unique way. As I said earlier, in cultures with Eurocentric beauty standards and some without Eurocentric beauty standards, 
Lightness has been always associated with purity, virtue and femininity, darkness with the opposite, masculinity, etc. So we code darker skin to be more manly and masculine. But with black men, on top of that, we also add dangerous, animalistic, savage, powerful. This somehow translates to the cultural belief that black men, at least on a screen, are more interesting to watch and command more of our attention with their presence. When we look at Jeremy Meeks, Jesse Williams, and the Duke, we see black men with vaguely European features. But when we see the A-list black superstars that we talked about at the beginning, we're talking about dark-skinned men with strongly black features, big lips, wide noses, nappy heads, dark shimmering bodies, rippling muscles. Black bodies, especially the dark ones, represent this mysterious and dangerous other. And this otherness dehumanizes and fetishizes us both by white and black consumers of media. Black bodies, dark-skinned black bodies especially, are more often object than subject. They are sentinel as opposed to being sentient. College football fans will follow their favorite team as they go around the country recruiting young African-American boys to play for this team. And these boys are often coming from hard and difficult backgrounds and they're giving up their bodies for the hopes of using this opportunity to play for a college team to make it to the NFL. But a couple of years ago, when those boys became sentient for just a moment and decided that they wanted to kneel for the national anthem, those boys received death threats. The people that loved them when they scored touchdowns hated them when they showed their humanity. Yara points out in her video that the main reason that black characters are always portrayed by light-skinned black women or biracial black women is that that's really the only way that, I don't know, the producers or the creators think that they can get the audience to empathize with those female characters or that may be pushing it a bit, but that's kind of, I think, one of the points she's trying to make. And I think that's true. The reality, especially for women, is that if we want audiences, predominantly white audiences, to empathize with these characters and removing all of the negative stereotypes and biases against dark-skinned black women is going to make that more possible. I'm not saying this is right, I'm just saying that's probably what is happening. However, that really still confounds what's going on with black male characters. You would think that if the goal is to get us to better empathize with black male characters, then we'd see more Michael Ely and Reggie Page Jean on the screen. But I argue that the goal with black male characters isn't to empathize, it's to fetishize. The goal for using black male characters is really just to get the audience to enjoy the spectacle and subsume themselves in the experience of seeing black masculinity in all its glory. The fetishization of black men's bodies is so effective that it allows us to completely separate black men's personhood and humanity from their body on screen. And thus the audience is more like a voyeur into the experience of blackness or black masculinity versus actually wanting to connect with or empathize with a character on the screen. Going back to my video about black masculinity in the movies, we see this in the very binary approach to the way black men exist in movies. Black men in the movies are either the idealized Superman or the fuck boy that is maybe tortured or maybe has a redemption arc, but there's not a lot of in between. We don't really get dynamic and interesting black male characters a lot of the times because having black male characters that don't embody enough of the mythology of black masculinity would break that mythology outside of the movie or at least maybe break the mythology within the mind of the viewer. And I'm including black men, black women, white people, everybody that watches these black male figures as they perform, whether it be sports or entertainment or rap music or on screen, what they really want is not the person's art or their performance, they want that experience of blackness. And I wanna point out that everybody contributes to this. This is not something to just blame on white creators or women or anybody. This is something that is socially embraced. Two of my favorite directors are Ryan Coogler and Spike Lee. They've both done really great work at breaking down and engaging with stories about black men. They've really done a great job of breaking down and engaging with the black male's experience in America. But even then, even when they have full carte blanche of what they want to do, for the most part, they're still operating within this same comfortable mythology. Hey, this is what 
I was looking for you. Oh! There you go. Playful as a kitten, strong as a bull elephant. Ooh. Good Lord, man! I don't buy the pig in the pole. So let's get to the sex shit. It's my opinion that you can tell a lot about people based on the things that get them off. Like, I'm not saying it's a one-to-one -one correlation that somebody's porn taste will be what they believe in in reality, but you best believe that there's something in there that holds meaning. I'm not saying that every white guy out there wants to fuck his stepsister or stepmother or stepdaughter, but the dynamics of power and taboo in those types of videos is kind of what plays into something in their psyche that makes that get them off. With that out there, the same way that there's an absence of light-skinned black men in movies, there's definitely an absence of light-skinned black men in porn. And this is porn produced by and for black and white people, and I guess everybody else in between. This is a bit murkier now because porn has been, I don't know, decentralized. You have a lot of amateur artists or pornographers making their own work, but the professionally made porn has historically looked for darker skinned black men who are obviously well endowed to fit a certain image of black male virility and sexuality on screen. Furthermore, there are usually only a handful of black men that will work in the porn industry at a given time due to the demands of the industry. And so the same men are usually performing both in all black porn as well as interracial porn. And the undertones of the scenes is incredibly racialized. And this is even something that happens in gay porn. You seldom ever see black men bottoming to white men in gay pornography. The sexual fetishization of black men is, in my opinion, highly under investigated. And I'm gonna just keep it real. This is because I think nobody really, really cares. The consequences of black men's sexual fetishization is deemed socially insignificant. Low key, I don't think people really want to hear what black men have to say about this topic. Too many people are invested in like the mythology of black man's sexuality and the objectification of black man's bodies to really try to change it. We speak on black man's sexual behavior in terms of dysfunction or who we're hurting and like that's real. That's some shit that needs to be engaged with. But we don't ever fully investigate where this dysfunction comes from and how it's born from opposite experiences that a lot of black men have. We don't talk about the fact that many black men are harassed by women who see them as mythological sex objects. This is probably because black men don't complain publicly about their experiences of being harassed and in more cases than you might think assaulted by women. When I did the video about the problems of consent in Bridgerton, I can't tell you how many like horrifying conversations I had with men, women, black, white, Asian, whomever, who could not see or take the idea of the Duke being a victim of a sexual assault because he was a guy and he should have been strong enough to push her off or he was clearly enjoying it or a lot of really horrifying shit that I don't think would have been said if the Duke wasn't a man. Men in general are not really seen as being capable of being victimized sexually unless of course their attacker is another man. But black men in particular are often silenced in their experiences with sexual victimization and those experiences are either minimized or laughed off because it doesn't really fit and it's clear that people are not comfortable with that topic just yet i'm a kid kid right i'm literally like five years old you literally did baby yeah, yeah. For real for real <laughs> i'm like five years old and yeah you know they end up doing whatever they was doing and i was you know i was copying off them niggas you ain't know what you was doing. That's crazy. crazy. You know what I mean? Lick, yeah, sucking on the titties, that type shit. And she was okay. That's so like gross. Five years old. And uh, how old was she? Bitch, R. Kelly, me. <laughs> when I think about it, you said what? How old was she around? She was grown. They look like they were grown. That's, That's so disgusting. 17, no. 18. 17, 18. This People do some crazy things. Him. That he actually lost his virginity at the age of eight. What? That is crazy. Crazy. That is so young. So well, you you do know, and you're talking about it. And Rihanna felt that it actually, because he got started so young, oh that's why he was so good. On screen, we see the sexuality of black men on display for audiences, whether it be in the girth of black porn performers or the walk of Denzel Washington in his heyday. If I had to point to one explicit thing that makes dark-skinned black men bigger stars in Hollywood, it's this. 
is because we have so commodified black men's bodies as to make it possible for us to see them as completely separate from every other aspect of their humanity. Part five, the double consciousness. So with the black body in America, we have this unique combination of all these forces. This leads to black men's bodies and virility being celebrated in certain ways while our humanity is ignored or even persecuted in others. And for some reason, it's manifested in black men both being this image of idealized masculinity, but also existing in this persistent state of fear. The funny thing, funny is probably the wrong word, but the same dehumanization process that makes it possible for us to cheer for and lust after and celebrate black men's bodies also makes it incredibly easy for police officers to shoot them because they feared for their lives. I don't think it's a coincidence that some of the most notable incidences of police brutality involve the unjust killing or abuse of larger black men who are also dark skinned. And this goes all the way back to Rodney King, onto Eric Gardner, Mike Brown, and of course, George Floyd. This is an example of what black sociologist W.E.B. Du Bois calls the double consciousness. The double consciousness is a concept that greatly explains the experience that pretty much all black people have of being an American, but also black at the same time and understanding that one's blackness comes with a certain set of messages and ideologies and codes that may be of very great importance and value to that individual, but that same set of messages and codes will be innately persecuted in an openly hostile American society that does not like black people. We as in everyone, want to see these black bodies perform for us, to tell us stories on screen. Something about that mixture of melanin and masculinity captivates when it gets to embody a character, but it becomes something else completely when it's just trying to be itself. And in the middle of this, I wonder, the thing that really brought this to my mind is, what are Light Skin Brothers feeling about this? Cause like, we all go through this, but I don't have the perspective. In my Bridgerton video, I made a couple of jokes about the Duke's complexion. And like, I feel bad about it now, but from my perspective then, I thought it was just a joke that was trying to point out how odd it is that light-skinned black men don't get to play that type of character. I obviously thought the joke was funny and wouldn't do any harm, but I don't know what it feels like to be a light-skinned black man and to have to deal with persistent attacks on your masculinity and to hardly ever see yourself in a leading role in a show like Bridgerton or really anything else. I can see how a light-skinned brother might look at that as yet another situation where their personhood is undermined and his lived experience erased. It's bad enough to not have a wide variety of images of black men in the media already, but just like dark-skinned women are in need of more representation on screen, I can see how light-skinned men might feel the same way. I have homeboys, I have friends that are light-skinned, that have sons who have light skin, light eyes and curly hair, and all they got is Drake. And Drake is trash. Black folks, black men especially, tend to practice collectivism whenever possible. So even though we are always aware of the differences in the way the world views and treats us, seldomly do those differences separate us in a significant way. Black folks rooted for Tiger Woods overall. We may have cracked jokes about him calling himself Coblin Asian, but we still rooted for him even as he downplayed his blackness. When Patrick Mahomes blew up, as soon as he took his helmet off and people saw his hair and his face, he went up on barbershops. He was in every black barbershop from 2019 until now. I remember when Naomi Osaka beat Serena Williams and people was like, oh man, some Osaka girl beat Serena Williams, but we saw the picture and it was like, oh, that's just a change of the guard. That's all good. Plus, as I said, having light skin definitely privileges black people in this country, especially in places of actual power, such as politics, education, and business. I doubt that Barack Obama would have ever won the presidency, especially back in 2008, had he been the same color as his father. Of the 11 black senators to ever exist in this country, Barack is actually one of the darker ones. One thing that I do, again, want to be clear on is that for men, the issue of colorism is probably a bit less of an internal struggle. Men are shielded from some of the negative experiences women have because the standards and expectations for men's behavior make us a little bit less vulnerable. But again, I say that as a man that has lived as a dark skinned brother, I do not know how it feels to be light skinned and to maybe be seen as less desirable by women. But I know that more than being seen as less desirable, dark skinned women are sometimes completely excluded from romantic partnerships 
by black men and everybody else. So there's definitely a difference there. That said, I don't have any answers to this paradox other than the fact that racism is fucking crazy and it doesn't make any sense. I made this video because I wanted to engage with this topic in a way that I didn't really feel enough people were speaking on. I think if we can look at a problem from a variety of angles and understand it better, that makes it easier to address. And hopefully that's what I did here. I was trying to shed some light on a topic from an angle that hasn't really seen the sun, at least from my perspective. So any light-skinned brothers watching this, please let me know in the comments, what have your experiences been? Am I downplaying your experiences of feeling like you don't exist in black communities or in black media? To everybody else, thank you so much for watching. Please leave a comment, like, share, and subscribe, all that good stuff. I really appreciate y'all spending time with me again today. Peace.